Yeah, hi guys, uh, Ryan back with you here again. Uh, still at the hotel here in uh, Indio, California. Um, I'd started this video and almost finished it uh, outside. Um, but uh, I got down to about the last minute or two where I was finishing up and my phone actually overheated and shut down and erased the entire video after all that work and explained everything and all that. And I like doing stuff outside, uh, but it, you know, it's like 120 degrees out there. And I actually had to like strip my phone down, take the otter box off of it and all that, and put it in the air conditioned fins in here in the hotel room to cool it down and get it to restart. Um, so I'm going to talk about a lot about this inside here. Then I can go outside and show you what I have to show you outside on the truck and all that, uh, why, it, why it's hot out there. Um, so if you've been following me, I picked up a load up in, delivered and picked up a load up in Kent, Washington, outside of Seattle. And um, I took that load to Loveland, Colorado. Uh, it was a light load, didn't have any issues, ran at night, it was cooler up there. I think the one last Sunday night a week ago, when I was sitting at the, uh, the TA there, excuse me, um, outside of Seattle there on 90, I actually had to turn my bunk heater on. It was like 43 degrees, I think, uh, when I woke up and, and checked my uh, truck there. Uh, so I woke up kind of freezing to death, and now I go from like 43, 45 degrees to like 120 down here, and I'm like a day, day and a half's drive. Basically, difference if you run down the coast, even though I kind of went the long way around. Um, so I had ran over there, and I delivered a load and did a drop and hook in Loveland, Colorado. And I know this is a lot of information about this, but it all make it all come together and make sense at the end or, or close to it. Um, so I did a drop and hook trailer down there in Loveland at the Walmart DC and had to run back up to Casper, Wyoming to get the load that I brought down to Goodyear, uh, Arizona. So the customer that I have, I'm picking up tomorrow that, uh, that I, you know, um, like I said I changed trailers and the trailer that I had was kind of dirty and this customer that I'm picking up for tomorrow the load after the load that I dropped in uh, Goodyear because I ran over here to the Los Angeles area as uh, where I'm picking up that load tomorrow going back to you know my home area I guess or close to home down by Louisville Kentucky um, it is like I guess it's recycled battery plastic so I guess it might have some lead and stuff and all that in it uh, so they're real weird. I guess with California, they have sensors and everything around the plant and they don't want any dust or dirt. Um, so on my way up to Casper, I figured, you know what the heck, I got time. I need to take a 30 minute break. I, already I had like 500 miles before um, I did it. You know, I was right at, I needed to do a 30 minute. So I figured I'd get fuel there to Flying J on 25 there south to Cheyenne. And there's a, a Blue Beacon. So I got the truck and trailer. When I do the truck, um, I typically get an engine wash, especially if I've just serviced it recently to clean all the oil, you know, the mess that I make basically from fuel and all that when I'm changing everything. Um, so I got an engine wash and I got an undercarriage wash and all that. And I know some people, it's debatable. Some people don't like to get the engine wash and stuff like that because you can, um, some of that stuff can get in the wiring harness and all that. But um, I, I choose to do it and, and keep the engine clean and, and make it, you know, because if there's something leaking even though you know it could have been something that you just did you could have serviced something you could change the oil you could change the fuel um and if it looks like it's leaking if you ever get pulled over by dot or something um they can manipulate that anyway i guess i just like to have a nice clean engine you know if there's something leaking i want to know it's leaking if it's really leaking i'll fix it but um i don't want to have where i've changed oil and gotten oil all over the place you know, and it's not leaking. It's just what the mess that I've made. Um, I don't want that to get me in trouble with uh, the DOT or something like that if I did get an inspection. So I always like to do an engine wash. But uh, so I got this engine wa or truck wash and engine wash, trail wash, all that down to Blue Big and Cheyenne. And uh, they did a great job. So nothing against them or anything like that. Uh, I started running back up. I had 25 there towards uh, towards Glen Rock to get this other load, and uh, about 10 minutes after I got on the road, my truck derated. You know, you get the little the little engine with the wrench icon on the dash, and uh, you know it cuts when my truck's a 485 ST uh, horsepower Cummins ISX 15. It's a CM 2250, which you know that's they were kind of a problem child, uh, but mine has the updates on it, so it's it's ran pretty well. Um, 
so with with my PDI, if you guys have watched that video, and know what I have on the truck. Um, with the horsepower gains and all that, and torque gains that uh, that PDI advertises, and what I've talked to their engineers about, and service techs, I mean, I should be, I'm right about 550 on the horsepower and close to 1900 or so on the torque. So I mean, it will, it does pretty well, um, even with 70, 80 thousand, I do pretty well. Even come like coming across Donner Pass. Uh, I typically pull that 50, 55 on, on the steeper grades, even, you know, gross and 80,000. I've pulled out of California, going up to, to Idaho or wherever at times, and I've been right at 80,000, and I can pull that pretty well. Um, I rarely have anybody come around me. Um, and it's usually I'm usually coming around everybody else, um, but I, I run it pretty hard. But uh, it, it, it pulls really well. Um, so when I get this D rate, I think it cuts close to 40% or so. So it's like this truck, if I'm heavy, it will not get out of its own. It won't even get out of its own way. It's, it's embarrassing. It's like I'm working at YRC again, driving a truck that has 2.7 million miles. Um, it, I, so I get up here and get this load. I cleared everything out on the PDI. I actually hooked up my Bosch and cleared everything out too and then checked everything. And I just cleared it out, got the load, I was there for like an hour and a half, then I went up to a little truck stop in Casper, a little Ambest up there, and uh, you know, parked for the day, I left out there about 10 o'clock at night, I get on uh, 25 because I kind of took the US routes and uh, state routes, uh, I took 287 down to Rollins, and then um, went up, got back on 80 and came down 789, route, uh, state route 789 which turns into 13, I believe, there in Colorado and kind of came around the back side of the Rockies down to 70. Then um, went over to Utah, then uh, came back around uh, to 191 there and came south. I stopped in Mon Monticello, uh, Utah for the day and um, it, it, it kept derated, it just kept going. I clear, I stopped and cleared, it derated again. I wasn't getting any like subsidiary codes. And uh, what I kind of mean by subsidiary is uh, typically when you have a D-rate, you'll have another code that actually causes that D-rate, or it's, it's kind of telling you why it's D-rating. But um, uh, a lot of the times, with I've had issues where it, this truck, it is D-rate, it won't give me any code, it won't give me a intake manifold pressure low or, or whatever, it just it just does it. And I haven't been, it, it seems like it does it in the higher elevations a lot where it doesn't give me another code. Um, it happens up, uh, up around Rollins, Sinclair, um, that type of area where the, up there where that where it's kind of flat and straight up here where it's 80, that part of uh, where the speed limit's 80 mile an hour up there. Uh, that kind of the, the basin up in Wyoming, it does it a lot up there. And there's a couple places over in Nevada where it does it on 80 that I have noticed. Um, and it, I, usually I clear it and it goes away and it's not a big deal. Um, and I go on with life, but uh, that night when I left out at Casper there, it was not, I would stop, I would stop, pull over, shut the truck off, clear it, turn the truck back on, i go 10 miles and it does not, sometimes not even 10 miles and it do it again. Uh, so it, it just wasn't going away, something just wasn't right. Um, so I figured, you know, I need to get down into Utah and all that because I need to make, I got to do a, a Friday morning delivery in order to, to make it over here to pick up this other load going back home uh, you know on Monday so I, I kind of had to push it even though I didn't really I'd rather it was very painful um, for me especially for my pride <laughs> I guess you could say uh, to be down to 15 mile an hour on some of these grades and I've got people you know uh, mega carrier guys coming around me so um, which typically doesn't have you know the Englands and primes and all them I'm getting passed by these guys and I'm like this is embarrassing uh, but I ended up getting down there and I was thinking, I finally started getting, I got a code or two for intake manifold pressure being low. So I figured, okay, maybe it's that intake manifold, uh, that IMAP sensor, which does your uh, intake manifold pressure and, and temperature. So I pulled it, I just changed, I change those about every 50 miles. And uh, some guys, you know, they just, they take them out and clean them and all that. But the, the sensor, they're like 50, 60 bucks. Um, and if you break it down, if you're changing every 50,000 miles, because those those are a big problem, a known problem. Um, so I just prefer just to change them at 50,000. And if you break it down by 50,000 miles, the cost of that, it's like a hundredth of a cent per mile to replace that sensor. So um, you can clean them and get away with it a lot. Um, I'll admit to that. But um, 
I, I for the cost of it, I mean, if it was a two, three hundred dollar sensor, I could understand the argument with cleaning it. But for fifty bucks, um, you know, every six months, it it just seems a lot less hassle and a lot easier just just to pop it out, change it out with a new one because there is a little bulb in there, and I'll show it to you earlier or a little bit later um, when we got to the truck. I'll show you what that sensor actually looks like and uh, as to why I change it. Um, so I got up there to Monticello and I pulled that sensor out. It was a little dirty. I took some, uh, you know, some the dry fast, uh, the flammable type brake cleaner, or parts cleaner. Um, you don't want to use the wet stuff, which I've talked about that before in other videos. Um, so I took the quick dry brake cleaner, the flammable stuff, cleaned it out and uh, sprayed it up in there with a the nozzle, got it real nice and clean, popped it back in. And, um, and after that, I, I went, to, you know, I figured out it should be good. I went to sleep because that's what I was thinking of what, what it was. So started up that night and went 10 miles D-rate, <laughs> D-rate with no code. Um, stopped, cleared it, went another 10 miles D-rate, no code. Then another 10 miles, and by, I stopped and cleared it again, and I got an intake manifold pressure again, low, and D-rate. And by then I just said, screw it, I'm just going to run it. I've only got 400 miles, and I'll be down there. And um, I actually called. I was going to buy another sensor. So I contacted Ken, Inland Kenworth down in um, the Phoenix area, not too far from where it was only 10 minutes from where it was delivering out there in Goodyear. They opened up at 6 a.m. I figured I didn't have to be at the other place, to, the place I was delivering until 8, so I figured I'll go in early. I'll go straight to Kenworth, get the parts, the sensor. I can Then I can go over to where I'm delivering at, and I can take care of it after I park or whatever. Um, but when I was sitting at, I, I didn't mention this before, uh, when I was sitting in Monticello there, I went through my Bosch HDS 200 and I was looking at the real time data and I kind of noticed that my atmospheric pressure or barometric pressure was like at 10.3 and for the altitude that I was at and looking at the barometric on the weather websites, I kinda, it just seemed out of place. It seemed like it was a lot lower than what it should be, what it should be reading. And that's why I like that real data because you can look at that and compare it with real time, real time temperatures, pressures, and stuff like that. Uh, so, I, I, it was about a, a one psi. By the time I converted inches of mercury, it, it just seemed to be um, a little off. Let me talk this second. So anyway, sorry, the that AC just kicked on in here, and I wanted to turn out. I didn't want that interfering with the noise quality, so I shut that off. But um. So I had seen that that barometric pressure wasn't kind of correlating to what the truck was rating with real time uh, weather info. Cause it, you know, if you, um, I went to flight school, I fly a little bit and all that. So um, barometric pressure and all that's kind of important to flight. And that's how a altimeter works is with barometric pressure and all that. Um, and there's a lot of other things going on with that. So I kind of know, from my experience, I kind of know what those numbers mean. Um, so if you convert inches of mercury, um, which standard at sea level standard pressure in inches of mercury is 29.92 inches of mercury, and convert that to psi, you times that by like 0 0.0.491 I believe. So it's a little bit less than half. Um, so standard pressure at sea level should be like 14.7 psi or 14.696 repeating or whatever. So it's really close to 14.7 psi. Um, and that's what your truck's going to read it in is psi, not inches of mercury. So you got to kind of figure out where you're at. You can get a weather forecast or whatever. Um, so it wasn't adding up. It seemed it was really low. And those numbers can, and, and that that's important to how an engine runs as far as uh, your fuel trim, fuel air mixture ratios, and also your timing at elevations. Um, so I had thought that that, that IMAP sensor did all that. And, um, and then I got to thinking, I was like, there's no way, because it's sensing off of the intake manifold. So there's really no way um, that, that it doesn't know what's going on outside. So I figured when I get down to Kenworth, I'm going to ask them if there's a atmospheric pressure sensor, temperature sensor, or both, or a barometric pressure sensor. So I get down there, I get that intake manifold uh, pressure and temp sensor. I bought that and I said, hey, what, 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 is there any other, can you do a search? So he did a search and there actually is a atmospheric pressure and temp sensor. And it's actually right next to that other sensor, but it's not like 
end the engine. It's just stuck in the wiring harness and taped around it. And I'm gonna show it to you here in a minute. But um, I bought that sensor, it was like 54 bucks. And you don't need any tools, nothing. It's right on the harness. You cut the tape, you, you unplug it, you stick the new one in, put new tape around it, and that's it. it literally, I changed it in their parking lot in like a minute and a half, basically. And, um, you know, if I had taken that in, they would have charged me probably $250, $300 to hook their computer up and diagnose it. They would have charged me the $54 for the sensor, then they probably would have charged me a minimum of an hour. So I probably would have been into $500 to, to change that sensor if they even would have figured it out. If you would have had somebody smart enough or new enough to actually look at that data and just say, instead of just saying, oh, there's no codes, we don't know what it is, let's throw a turbo on it for eight grand or nine grand. And that's what a, guy, a lot of guys get into because these guys don't actually look at the real data and say, this isn't right and replace that $150 sensor. They think, oh, you got low intake manifold. There's no other explanation. It's it's, it's got to be a turbo. It's got to be an intercooler, whatever. And next thing you know, you spend eight, nine, ten thousand dollars, and you drive out and you go 50 miles down the road, and the same thing, the same code pops up again. So I ended up, I I bought those two sensors. I replaced both of them: the atmospheric pressure sensor and also the intake manifold and pressure sensor. Like I said. I, I can art, you know, that's just my opinion. I'd rather just change them out. Like I said, a lot of guys, you can clean them, but um, I'd rather just change them out for 50 bucks. It's 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 a drop in a bucket for over 50,000 miles at a time. Um, but again, all this started to stem from when I got that truck wash over there. So I'm thinking, I'm gonna show you this little sensor when I go outside, and it there's actually little holes in the back of it. So I'm almost, I think that there was water that got into it or something or something happened where it screwed up that sensor because it was kind of funny that it happened right when I got that right after I got that truck wash and it wouldn't go away um, so I changed it out I ran from Goodyear Arizona over here to Indio and um, you know there is a couple there is a little mountain range there I mean I think you go up to about 2,000 feet and um, I actually on my PDI I had it set where I can change it so I was actually watching barometric pressure and it seemed to be operating within range, you know, in correlation with what pressure should have been. So, um, and I didn't have any D rates, any codes or anything like that on the run over here. So um, going back from, from Los Angeles back to Kentucky, I mean, I'm not gonna have any huge, I, I might get up to, the way I'm gonna go across I-10, then uh, over to Las Cruces, then I usually cut up US 70, US 54, up to 40. So I mean, I might get up to five, 6,000 feet. So we'll see how it operates then, but um, I think that might have been a lot of my trouble. And um, you know, and that can, that that like I said that that little sensor, uh, it, I don't hear a lot about it on YouTube, um, and I don't hear about it a lot on internet form. Nobody really talks about that atmospheric pressure and temp sensor. So um, if you're having these same issues that I'm talking about, you may for 54 bucks or whatever, it may be worth uh, your time changing it out and see if that works. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and go out to the truck now and hopefully my phone doesn't get too hot and shut down. And uh, I'll show you those two sensors and show you where they're located at. And then we'll wrap up and call it a day. All right, back out here in the sauna. It's extremely hot. Like I said, this thing shut down. I wasn't even in direct sunlight or anything. I was just, when I, I, I said, I got like the sixth, like pretty much everything I've talked about, I like to do outside and talk and uh, kind of show everybody around walking around the truck and see some scenery other than sitting in the truck or or uh, in a hotel room for that matter which I don't do very often at all and I like to save as much money as I can because uh, I mean even though it wasn't too bad of an expense too much I'd rather stick that money in my pocket you know 165 bucks or whatever Place is starting to get busy again. Kind of cleared out a little bit earlier. Everybody moving in, they're all looking at me like I'm crazy walking around with this camera stick and all that.
All right, so we're back out here at the truck. First thing I'll show you, I'm gonna try to do this quick for this if something happens out here where my phone shuts off and I lose this entire video again. I'll show you the PDI here and how I got it set up. Okay, so right now I've got my PDI set up for barometric pressure, so I'm like at 14.5, which is pretty close to being within range, that, that sea level down here. And um, you know, those of you that have these or something like it, um, you can I can click on the gauge, and I can basically I can put in any of these parameters, whatever I want to watch. Um, um, so if I think something's wrong, I can put any of that stuff in and uh, kind of keep an eye on it. So, so that's that's so that's what I've been watching. All right, so I'm going to show you the two sensors here. Uh, the first one I'm going to show you is the uh, IMAP sensor, the uh, intake manifold uh, air temperature and pressure sensor. And it looks like that. It's got a little probe on the bottom. There's a little bulb in there. And uh, I mean, like I said, you can clean that off, but I mean, with the heat and all that that goes through your intake, that, that can get distorted and whatnot. Uh, there's a little O-ring on there. Uh, these are about $57, uh, 40, I mean anywhere from 40 to 60 is what you can get them for. And uh, part number on that, 289-7334 is for that uh, intake manifold, uh, air temperature and pressure sensor. That's that. And like I said, I change those out about every 50,000. Um, your part number may be different, but like I said on a, a IS615, CM2250, I think the 2350 is the same as well. Um, that's that's going to be your part number. Um, this is that barometric pressure or ambient air pressure and temperature sensor. Um, and you can see it has this, that little deal with a couple holes in the back and that's where it senses everything. And this doesn't actually go, it doesn't plug into anything. It just kind of hangs out on the wiring harness. It plugs into a plug and hangs out and I'll show it to you here in a second. Uh, part number on this is a uh, 289-7331. Again, 289-7331. Uh, um, and like I said, you can you should be able to go to your dealer, come to the or whatever, give them your engine serial number, tell them you're looking for ambient air pressure sensor, and that's this guy here. So I'm gonna go up here and show you where these are at on the engine before my phone shuts down because it's like excruciating, yeah, excruciatingly hot out here. Uh, so I'm gonna turn this around. Okay guys, so that uh, atmospheric pressure and temp sensor is right here. It's right in the, well, it's right in the wiring harness. Uh, you just pull this rubber back. Uh, there's a little bitty tab right in the top. You have to take a paper clip or a little bitty screwdriver and push that this way towards my finger. Then you can push this down. It doesn't have to come all the way out. Just pop it down a little bit. And then you'll be able to press this down and that's how all these work if you see that type you just gotta just pull them out like an eighth of an inch and you can press this down and then you can pull the sensor out i mean obviously you have to pull it out of that that tab right there but um then you just put new tape around so you just cut the old tape off push that you know activate that tab press it down push that in pull the old sensor out uh push your new one in Lock it in, press that back up, tape it up, and you're good to go. And that's the atmospheric uh, or barometric pressure sensor. Um, the intake manifold and pressure sensor, or intake manifold, pressure, and temp sensor is right here. Um, the way you get that out, it's a 10 millimeter bolt right there. Loosen that up. You don't have to take it all the way out, just loosen it then that little keeper, you can just push that out of the way. Then uh, you have to take a screwdriver or something and kind of pry up on that. You'll pull it out connected. Then um, all you gotta do is press this down and you can pull the wiring harness off of it. Pop a new one on, press it back down in there. Uh, that little O-ring, you might wanna put some oil or something on it just to lube it, press it in there. 
move your keeper back around, tighten it up, and it's a done deal. So, I mean, you can literally change both of these sensors in like five minutes. So it's, it's a pretty simple procedure. So I like to change them out about every 50,000, six months. I mean, I, I haven't changed this one. The one I just took out and changed still had red Cummins paint. So it was, it's got almost 700,000 miles on it and it's going on eight years old. So um, I think it may have been one of our problems. So that's those two other uh, little deals right there that we, I know we talked about this sensor before, the intake manifold pressure and temp sensor. But um, I'm adding this one to my list of stuff to replace every every so often. So, so there you go. Um, so two pretty simple sensors. They're right next to each other, easy to get to. You can literally change both of them out in five minutes. And uh, like I said, that seems to have solved the problems I've had. And those control a lot of different stuff: fuel economy, power, fuel trim, fuel air uh, ratio mixtures, and all that stuff. So. Uh, I'm probably going to add the uh, that ambient air pressure sensor. That's probably going to be to my list to change out every 50,000. I mean, if I can change for 100 bucks, if I can change both these sensors out every six months, I'm going to do it just to avoid any any hassles in the future and uh, just the fuel economy and all that and power. Uh, so those are two things I just want to throw out there. Hope that helps you all out. Again, uh, I know this got a little bit elongated. Um, I was kind of leading up with the whole story and how this all went, so I can kind of. If somebody else you're having the same problems it might match up to your story and it might be the same things that's why i kind of got a little bit long there in the beginning and uh sorry for being in the room and all that uh, but it's so hot out here I, that's the only way i could do this video but again uh, give us a thumbs up uh, subscribe uh, comment if you need to and all that and we'll get to you and um, like i said we'll see you all next time good luck out there